we're going to uh, be in Psalm 8. Uh, this has been a really incredible, blessed Psalm for me personally, because the first time that I actually really dug in and studied this was about two months ago, maybe three. And I sat here uh, when, when my office, when I had my desk sitting right here in front of this bookshelf, I sat here and just <laughs> tears began to run out of my eyes because I realized how, how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. Made, I know. You know, it's like yep. Hashem has done, it's just incredible what yep. the angels think of us. Sometimes we beat ourselves up and we feel mm -hmm. bad and all those things. And I just, I was so grateful. I just spent, and, and prayer that evening was so special because you can truly lay yourself to sleep and say, what a privilege it is to be alive in this yeah. world. Absolutely. You know, absolute privilege. Yeah. It starts off by saying this, the conductor on the Gitit, a psalm by David. A Gitit is an instrument. Uh, it's crafted uh, especially for uh, the craftsman from in Gath. Rashi says this, and in, invented by a Gathian musician. I don't know exactly what a Gitit is, but these are, I guess, musical scores that are written along with these words as well. It says, God, our master, how highly is your name throughout the, the earth to you who set, I mean, you who set, have set your majesty in the heavens and from the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have established your might to counter your enemies. We're going to stop right there for a second. We started off with a great magnanimous psalm beautiful psalm that's going to bring us encouragement especially in today's day and time one one of the biggest struggles that we're having in this postmodern era after all the things that we've gone through with covid this and that etc isolation is a sense that you feel like things are out of your control you feel like dog on it everything is running our lives and we don't have any choice uh, into the matter. We just got to go along with this horrible economic cry, uh, uh, economic uh, things that are going on. The, the, uh, the, what do you call it? The uh, uh, disease that has wrecked the bodies of people and continue to wreck the bodies of people. I'm hearing now that they say that Australians are dying at a higher rate than they have since world war two, and they cannot put their finger on exactly what it is. However, when we read this, we also have to realize that we came into uh, a, a magnificent um, agreement with the master of the universe. And we made this agreement to come here for the very purpose of taking a hold of this Torah that God himself said was not made to be stored in Shemaim. It wasn't to be stored in some some relic of a place in Shemaim, it needed to be at the lowest level. So all of us have decided to become part of this great experiment. Unfortunately, physicality has so robbed humanity of any level of, of highness or connection at a higher level, it's difficult for us to attain it. However, I do believe that every human being created in the earth today has a purpose to help bring about this great experiment and, and its success. Now, philosophers have maintained that the human finds com a completion and fulfillment through intellectual pursuit, and they therefore consider the angels who are pure intellect to be inherently superior to the humans. We've always sort of assumed that. But God and his Torah tell us something very different. Fulfillment is not found in gaining knowledge, but in the fulfillment of the will of the creator. Knowledge is no more than a means toward developing awe of his glorious name. Thus, men is superior to the angels since the primary fulfillment of God's will occurs in the physical world that man inhabits. This explains why God pays more attention to the physical world than to the heavens. As the Midrash states in Bereshit Rabbah 19, 7, 19 verse 7, in the beginning of the creation before man's uh, sin of man, 
the sins of man, God primary, uh, God's primary presence was found in the physical world. Beautiful thing. So we already see that from the setup of this verse that the psalmist David is, is saying, you have created this thing. You have set yourselves the glory of the universe. The very creation itself declares that. And then verse two, a uh, verse two continues on. He says, here's another alter alternative to that opening statement. God, our master, how mighty is your name throughout the earth, who you have set your majesty upon the heavens. Alternatively, how about how mighty is your name throughout the earth, though it would seem more fitting for you to have said, set your majesty upon the heavens. Rashi says, you know, it sounds odd that God puts his majesty in physicality, not the heavens. Now, start following me and you're going to realize that God Almighty, the master of the universe, sets up his dominion in physicality. There is something going on that maybe we will figure out one day, but right now, this is still a big mystery. It says, you have set your majesty upon the heavens. Who have set the majesty on the heaven? Our actions in the physical world, good or bad, have cosmic repercussions, right? And we, we've, we hear all these sort of metaphorical ideas. It says that when we sin, uh, we create angels that, that will torment us or to cause us to repent. And when we do mitzvahs, we create angels that also aid us to do more mitzvahs. Now, are we literally creating angels? I, you know, I, I'm, I don't think that's the case. I think it's a metaphoric idea that says that your actions have reactions. Positive actions bring positive results. So it seems that we as created beings on this earth in the physical world, we are helping to produce some level of, of spiritual currency by our mitzvahs that somehow affects the heavens and also affects the universe. One day we're going to fully understand it, but truly we are part of bringing about this whole completion of Hashem's universe. It says, uh, uh, it says, okay, I, I got that point. Next one. Uh, verse three says, uh, we heard verse three, verse four says, when I behold your heavens and the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, I wonder what is man that you should remember him, son of man, that you should be mindful of him. Yet you have made him a little less than the angels and crowned him with honor and glory. You know, it says that the angels complained. I don't know if you remember this. When they found out that the master of the universe was going to create mankind first, and then give them the Torah. He's like, they're going, no. It, they complained three specific times during the creation of man. In the giving of the Torah, they were like wiping sweat off their brow, thinking, Hashem, you know that they, they are going to make a mess of this. They're going to trample on your Torah. It's such a holy thing. But then we're going to discover from the beginning of this text that the intent was God to give the Torah to be put at the lowest level. Now, next, the last one, the resting of the divine presence on the tabernacle. Each time the angels rejected God's interest in the affairs on the earthly saying here, set your majesty upon the heavens. You get that? No, 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 not there. Do it up here where we are, where purity and loyalty and honor and integrity all exist. Do it here. He says, what is man that you should remember him, son of man, that you should be mindful of him? Like, why do you care this much? Oh, man, this is going to get exciting. By the end of the psalm, however, they concede saying, how mighty is your name throughout the earth? They no longer say, set your majesty upon the heavens, according to Midrash Tehillim, Shabbat 88b. So the angels no longer say, put it here in heaven. We see, we've seen the results. This, this is a capable action that the master of the universe knew was going to work. Now, let's look at creation 
of the human. When God sought to create the human, he consulted with the angels. What did he say? Let us make man in our image, right? So it says, uh, he consulted with the angels who said, what is man that you should remember him? Okay, this is what the psalm is telling. So the section that we just read is a quote from the angels that says, what is man that you should remember him? Who is he? I mean, come on. He's made out of dirt. He's, he's a little lower than an angel, maybe a little higher than a monkey, right? Why are you doing this? God then demonstrated to them the wisdom of Adam, who, unlike the angels, was able to able to, uh, to intuitively name the an animals and the beast of the field, that he was able to be so connected with the animals. It says that he was able to sort of enter into the animal and know their, their character, their traits, et cetera, and that's how he named them, uh, from the birds, et cetera, et cetera. Adam, Adam was also uh, intuitive in his own name as well, as that of God, God said to the angels, see what wisdom is in, his, in his, is in his heart. Yet you tell me, what is man that you should remember him? Midrash Tehillim says that. Now, here in the giving of the Torah, part of our discussion and part of the dispute the angels had, the angel said to God, master of the universe, is it proper for you to give the Torah in, uh, get to, for you to give the Torah in the heavens? For we are holy, your Torah is holy and pure, and your Torah is pure, and we are life, and your Torah is life. Better that it should remain with us, God said to them. It's not fit to endure among you. According to Job 28, 13, listen to these words. It says, the Torah cannot be found in the land of the living, i.e. the heavens. Many times we'll read a verse like that and thinking, well, what does it mean the Torah can't be found in the land of the living? It's that. No man sees God and is still alive, right? Where can we take, uh, where can the Torah endure? In the lower world. That is as written as I just said in, in, in Psalm, I mean, I, Isaiah, I'm sorry, also Isaiah 45, 12 says, I have made the earth and upon it I created the human, Midrash Tehillim. This idea of a mortal in heaven, when Moses ascended to the high, the angel said to God, master of the universe, what is this mortal doing among us? God replied to receive the Torah. They said to him, and this, they're talking about Moshe, that Torah, which is precious and hidden, you indeed intend to give it to flesh and blood? What is man that you should remember him? Set your majesty upon the heavens. Here is the... the here is the argument again when Moses was, was received up into Shemaim. God then instructed Moses to respond to the angels, but he was afraid they would burn him up in, the, in a breath of their mouth. God told him to hold on to his royal throne and then re respond. Moses then demonstrated that the Torah clearly was meant for humans since, it, uh, since its contents bears no relevance in the world of angels. The mitzvahs have nothing to do with angels. Uh, the traditions have nothing to do with angels. It has everything to do with the, the people of God on this earth. Now, it says, listing, li uh, listing the Ten Commandments, Moses rhetorically asked the angels, did, did you descend into Egypt? Were you slaves to Pyro? Do you work did you work for the rest of the, uh, di do you work that you, uh, you require a day of rest? Do you engage in commerce that you would need to take an oath? Or do you have a father or mother citing the prohibitions against murder and adultery and theft? He said, is there jealousy among you? Talking to the angels. And there an evil inclination is among you? Here's the question. You're not the one having to deal with all the stuff that we have to deal with, right? Immediately, they conceded to God, as it is written at the end of the psalm, God, our master indeed, how mighty is your name throughout all the earth. Alone, they no longer stated, set your majesty upon the heavens, Shabbat 88b. Think about this. The master of the universe gave us this Torah 
what an incredible gift it has given to us. And even though many people throughout history have not followed, quote unquote, followed the Torah, whether being righteous people of the nations or the Jewish people, uh, we see the lasting effect of Torah in the nations because of the laws that we have set up throughout the nations. Most people in, I would say a lot of nations follow this moral code that the Torah uh, speaks about. Moses responds that it is precisely in the physical world, which contains in Egypt commerce and jealousy, and the essence of Torah is revealed, since it is there that God's desire in creation is fulfilled to create a divine dwelling in the physical world. Now, we've heard this term that God concealed himself after creation, but yet he wants to place within creation a vessel of his divine will and purpose at the same time. Now, let's talk about a winning argument that takes place. After the sin of the golden calf, the angels rejoice, saying, now the Torah will, will return to us. Okay, this is the sin of the golden calf. They're like, yay, they blew it. <laughs> we get it back. And here it goes. When Moses ascended to receive the second tablets, the angel said to God that the Jewish people did not deserve the Torah since they had defiled its laws by worshiping idols. God responded and says, did you not eat milk and meat when you visited Avraham? As it is written, Genesis 8, 18, 8, and Avraham took cream and milk and, and a calf. But when one of their children come home from school and his mother gives him bread and milk and meat, they say, today, my teacher taught me, Exodus 34, 26, do not cook the milk or the kid in the mother's milk. Um. The angels could not come up with any response to this argument. At that moment, God told Moses, Exodus 34, 27, write for you these words while the angels were still without a response. As Shimon would say, they were gobsmacked. They didn't have any response at all. The divine presence in the tabernacle, let's talk about this epic struggle that took place. It seems that the angels are not only shocked the first time, but every time it seems that Hashem raises the ante, now he's going to put his divine presence in a physical place. God said to Moses, make for me a tabernacle in which I will speak with you. Not only this, I desire to dwell near my children. When the angels heard this, they began to say, Master of the universe, why are you leaving the higher ones and descending to the lower ones? Set your majesty upon the heavens. God said to the angels, see how much I cherish the lower world, so much so that I descend and dwell in within uh, curtains of goat skin. This is found in Midrash Tekuma uh, and Teruma 9. The day when Moses completed the tabernacle was, the, was a painful one for the angels. They said, now we will remove his presence from among us. And I'm sorry, now he will remove his presence from among us and make his glory dwell below with his children. God said to the angels, do not pay any attention to this, for my presence will always be with you above. But this is this was false. It was comfort. It was but this was false comfort, as it were, since the contrary, God primary primary presence is below, as it is written. Uh, in Psalm 148, 13, I think his majesty is upon the earth and secondarily in the heavens. The term, how mighty is your name upon the earth? The angel said that when God gave the secret, uh, the secret wisdom contained in the divine names uh, that we now know in the Zohar, uh, it says that the divine names to the righteous of the earth. This was when it was declared. It says, from the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have established might and, and to, to counter your enemies, to silence foe for, uh, for, uh, uh, aven and avenger. Uh, from the very first moments of our entry into this world, we encounter the miraculous perfection of God's works 
and the phenomenon of the of a newborn emergency from the emerging from the womb and immediately know how to suckle. It's amazing. The flow of milk is neither too strong nor too weak, further demonstrating the intelligent design of the creation, which silenced those who claim the universe emerged by an accident. This was according to Radak. Likewise, we see miracles of language. The wondrous phenomenon of small children learning to speak and understand in a relatively short time. Uh, the continuing on the idea of the mouth of babes. From the mouth of babes and sucklings alludes to the to the words of the Israelite babies during the splitting of the sea. At that time, the babies rested on their mother's knees, a suckling nursed on his mother's breast. But when these children perceived the divine presence, they began to call out, this is my God. This is actually found in Sota 30b. It's beautiful. Think about that. They recognized the divine presence because they had seen it before in the fields, uh, in the fields of Egypt where they survived without their parents and, and, and suckled on milk and honey that God miraculously provided for them. This is also found in Sota 11b. David thus proves the superiority of the humans over angels, since they, despite being completely spiritual, are unable to see God, and instead they say, where is the place of his glory? Yet these babies and sucklings, physical beings, were able to point and say, this is my God. Wow. Miners as guarantors. How about this? The Israelites stood ready to receive the Torah. At Matan Torah, God said to them, I am giving you my Torah. Bring me uh, uh, suitable guarantors who will ensure that you will observe the Torah, and then I will give it to you. The Jewish people offered the patriarchs as guarantors, but God was not satisfied. They offered the prophets, but still God was not satisfied. Finally, <coughs> finally, they offered their children, and God said, these certainly are good guarantors. Through them, I will give it to you. As it is written, from the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have established might. This is found in Shir Hashirim Rabbah 124. Now we talk about the rallying of the children to counter your enemies to silence and foe your avengers is what this is talking about. Let's see, what verse are we on now? Um, angels, you made rule over them, then the beast of the field. Uh, did I make it to verse eight yet? You made him a ruler over your handiwork. You placed everything under his feet, the sheep and cattle of all of them. Yeah, and the beasts of the field, uh, uh, even the birds in the sky and the flesh of the sea. And uh, he traversed the paths of the sea. God, our master, how mighty is your name throughout all the earth. Okay, so with that being said, um, where did I just leave off, guys? Um, Okay, here we go. Verse four, uh, chapter eight. And when I behold, let's see, did I already? Uh, yeah, I did verse four. Hold on. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Found my notes. Sorry. Um, and it says the sheep and the cattle, and all of them, all, also the beast of the field. These are ver these verses conclude the argument against the angels who continue to point to the degrad uh, <clears throat> degradation of the Jewish people <clears throat> throughout the exile as proof of their inferiority. David responds by telling them in the end, in the messianic age, when sheep and cattle will lie peacefully with the uh, predatory beast of the field, when the wolf will lie with the lamb at this at the same time during that time, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, alluding to the different types of angels, as well as Leviathan that traverse the sea, they will uh, uh, they will admit God, our master, indeed, how mighty is your name throughout the earth. 
uh, they will recant the words in this re- recant the words in verse one, set your majesty upon the heavens. They will admit that God's presence is to be found primarily in the physical world. Last but not least, how mighty is your name throughout the world, throughout the earth. The angel said to God, your glory is to dwell with the, your nation and your children. When we calculate the beauty of God's intent for us and how wonderful he is in creating us and giving us this opportunity to participate, it seems that we have uh, the free will to come here, even in the point of possibly reincarnation because we have chosen to make uh, correction and things. I, I sometimes wish that we did remember, but I also believe it would be pretty traumatic. Let's conclude this uh, study in Psalm 8. Uh, there are six ways that mankind is described as unique, uniquely special in this psalm. First, he's crowned with glory and honor. The psalmist declared that God has crowned human beings with glory and honor, making them the pinnacle of his creation, Psalm five, uh, 8, verse 5. When you ponder the idea that we feel so low and lowly and so inadequate and lacking of abilities, maybe lacking of our, our uh, intent to be a better person, We beat ourselves up, and we don't realize that God has crowned us with glory and honor. That's what we need to realize, is we've got to live up to the very name and the thing that he has created us to be. Second, made us a little lower than the angels. The psalmist recognized that human beings are not divine, but they still are higher than the rest of God's uh, earthly creatures, Psalm 8, 5. The next one. We're given dominion over the works of God's hands. What incredible responsibility that God would allow us to be not co-creators. What's the word for uh, to partnership with him to take care of creation. That's why I, I love the idea of conservation in the world that we live. I, I love the idea that we want to try to quote, save the planet. Unfortunately, there are those people out there who have made it their their agenda, thinking that they can they have a higher purpose to to do something that not even God has given us the ability to do. We can't save anything. All we can save is ourselves. But at the same time, God has given us the fiduciary responsibility to take care of our planet. And you know, I I I, I in my conscience can't even. Uh, uh, think about a fact of trash falling out of my car in a parking lot and not picking it up. I couldn't imagine being someone who wants to trash the earth. Uh, uh, God entrusted humans beings with the responsibility of caring for and managing creation, made rulers over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all the creatures of the land. This and its extension of the previous point, emphasizing the, the breadth and dominion uh, that God has actually given mankind. He's given us that ability. Uh, next, number five, fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist marvels at the intricate and complex nature of human beings, recognizing the unique blend of physical, mental, emotional characteristics that make us all who we are. While I'm on that subject, I think in understanding the mysterious nature in which we are created, and when I say mysterious, I'm not talking about weird, I'm just talking about the the complexity is far beyond our ability to have a discussion in this class. I would even say that psychologists and philosophers have attempted to map the human mind to explore the different possibilities and, and struggles that the human mind has, and they still have not come up and figured it out. Why? Because we are really fearfully and wonderfully made. And I say that because even the person with the deepest of struggles mentally or physically 
they're still fearfully and wonderfully made. The person who struggles with mental health issues and struggles with life itself, they are fearfully and wonderfully made. The person who is uh, who is handicapped and having the ability to do the things that other people do, that person is still fearfully and wonderfully made. And the only way for us to reach a higher level in our life is to come to the realization that we are very unique beings in this earth and we have a bigger purpose. We're not just flailing around in a physical world without a purpose, without a goal, without something that needs to be rectified. So we should all be asking ourselves, if I am fearfully and wonderfully made, what am I doing about it? How am I treating it? No one in their right mind, if given, for example, a a precious item, I don't know, uh, think of some very expensive, precious item. How about 15 ounces of gold. That's a lot of money. It'd be nice to have. You wouldn't go schlupping that around and throwing it in your trunk of your car and sliding it under the seat and throwing it in the garage. No, you would, you would treat that thing with value. You would guard it. You would protect it. When we fully understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we realize that what we need to do is tune ourselves up to the very purpose that God has for us. As you guys can see over here, let me point my camera over. You see those, that radio equipment right there? So I'm an amateur radio operator. And this, this radio was built in 1986. It's an old radio. But still, I can talk literally to Spain, to Canada, all over the world with this radio and a wire antenna that's on my fence. It's an amazing thing. But this radio is useless if I don't fully understand its capabilities. It's completely useless. It's it's a paperweight for crying out loud. It doesn't give me any purpose. It doesn't help me in any way. It's just a piece of junk that I should soon just throw in the trash. But until I was able to discover what it was capable of doing, when I discovered that, I'm like, you've got to be, I can do that with that. It's that simple. I can do that. And then I had to learn how to dial the, to dial the radio in and to tune its knobs and to do everything perfectly. That is understanding the, the complexity and the uniqueness of this piece of equipment and its potential and what it can do. I would have never understood it if I didn't put my hands to it. What we have to do is put our hands on ourselves, on our purpose of our life and realize we have secrets locked within us and capabilities locked within us. We have not even contended with. We have potential in our mindset to create what we think or to think and create positive things in the world. I, I, I laugh at my wife. She's so much like my, my, my mother of blessed memory. My mom could literally buy, uh, let's say that she was, you know, they're up in Washington state somewhere and they're traveling. They go into a little store and she finds a dress on sale for $10. And she's like, so happy. I got this dress at this nice place for $10, but it's missing a belt. And so she would just keep saying, I'm going to find that belt. I'm going to find that belt. And lo and behold, they come to Houston and they go to Goodwill and she finds the belt for that dress. Like, like, what is the possibility? That was my mom over and over. That is my wife over and over, because I do believe that we have the capability in our mind if we meditate on something. And I'm not talking about trying to be all, you know, blue smoke and cherubims type deal. I'm just talking about be positive. Say, you know what? I'm going to find that now with my wife when she says, oh, you know, I'd like to find a an arrangement to go here on the wall. I would like this. And I'm saying, well, you'll find it. Trust me, you'll find it. And she does every time. So the point is, what things have we not tapped into, folks? What beautiful things have we not tapped into? And and Baruch Hashem, we live at the heels of Mashiach. And with the heels of Mashiach comes not only great difficulties and, and trials, but also great revelation and understanding, whether it is from science, whether it is from our great rabbis who teaches us, the great Kabbalists that are out there, we are beginning to see things unlocked that can teach us about how fearfully and wonderfully made. So, you know, praise God. Hopefully we can all move forward and grow together. Last but not least, we are capable of praising 
and worshiping God uniquely unlike anything else in creation. The psalmist acknowledged that human beings have the ability to, to recognize and honor God's greatness, to offer him praise and worship, and to enjoy a relationship with him. I'm not sure how the creator of the universe has a relationship with the rest of his creation. We all know trees do exactly what they were created to do. There's no free will. They do exactly what they were created to do. Dogs aren't evil. I keep telling people cats aren't evil. Even though I give cat people a hard time, they're not evil. They're just animals. They do what they're supposed to do. I was looking at Lacey today, and I gave little Carly, who's four pounds, little old chihuahua, a little snack, a doggy snack. And Lacey's standing about four inches from Carly's face, waiting for her to drop something or to not eat it so she can take it. And I was like, Lacey, you reminded me that you're just a dog. And I understand that, but don't even think about it, right? I know that's what you're going to do. You'll snatch it if I let you. And I, it just took another reminder. That's, that's our base nature. But yet he made us fearfully and wonderfully. And we don't have to respond out of the base animal nature. We are able to praise God. And so in the conclusion of this, we all give homage and, and praise to the master of the universe for creating us and putting in this world at this place, at this time. All of us came up with the decision to be here at this place in this time, and it might seem daunting. It might seem more incredible to you than, than you can grasp, but trust me to know that you are very special we are very special and that we should pursue this knowledge and how we're going to uh, truly live in the purpose of this knowledge. So that concludes the lecture. Let's get into some dialogue, some discussion.